across here. Before that particular day, that Friday, the, the crisis started, there was tension in just Crisis will occur, but what we know, we kept receiving messages from both sides. Sometimes people will tell you that they have received a message that the Muslim will come and attack their communities. The Muslim will also tell you that they have received a message that the Christians are coming to attack their communities. Unfortunately, our context is such that the division becomes very easy because majority of the indigenous were Christians and majority of the settlers were Muslims. Religious leaders didn't help us at that time from both sides because you, if you hear preaching from the Christian side, very, very discouraging. And it's, it's like calling for a fight. So also from the Muslim end, it was all the same. We were scared. If you go to the market, if you are to buy something, you find it very difficult to buy from a Christian because you've been told that the Christians are looking for all means to poison you. No había, digamos, una claridad en qué iba a terminar la guerra. Solo sabíamos que hay masacres, que hay persecución, pero no sabíamos en qué iba a terminar. Cuando llega el conflicto armado interno, nos damos cuenta porque cuando se dan las masacres, se dan los primeros ataques al, a los destacamentos militares que secuestraron a varias personas y que nunca se supo con ellos. Entonces, esto fue como el principio del conflicto armado interno, en el que ya el ejército se instaló, que ya empezaron como las inspecciones, acercar a las familias, a las casas, y empezar a, a someter miedo, ¿verdad? Porque al final ya ver la presencia del ejército es que están buscando a alguien, están buscando algo. Nosotros ya estábamos fuera. Sin embargo, ese fue el punto de partida para nunca regresar. Porque cuando ya llegaron al, 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 a la aldea, digamos, a las primeras casas, quemaron la casa de nosotras. Un vecino que nunca quiso salir de allí, eh, lo quemaron vivo con toda su familia, ¿ya? Eh, y luego los, si no estoy mal, fueron como 37 personas las que eh, masacraron en el centro de Chalval. Todos los que encontraron el camino los juntaron, quemaron el mercado, quemaron. Para nosotros ahí terminó todo. Era más fácil hacer la vida en, en las montañas y la gente se empezó como a reunir de las diferentes familias y hacer, ahí empiezan las comunidades de población en resistencia. años después de la firma de los acuerdos de paz, no hay cambios, no, hay, no existe la democracia que estamos queriendo que se dé en Guatemala. Sí. 
being a woman that is trying to champion this cause, it was really a big issue. Karena dibutuhkan 30 persen harus ada perempuan, enggak ada perempuan yang naik, maka taruhlah nama saya di situ, biar orang lagi bisa naik. If you look at commemoration and memorialization after the end of the war in Sri Lanka, you will find that oftentimes the memorialization was done to signal the victory of one party. Aquí están los representantes de todos los pueblos, representados por sus autoridades indígenas, por sus autoridades legítimas. Hoy vamos a presentar los tres recursos de amparo, pero que hablen las más sagradas varas. Eso es lo que queremos. No... Esperaríamos, esperaríamos derecho a la alimentación, derecho a la educación, derecho a seguridad, derecho a vivir en paz. Pero ya cuando uno empieza a verse en las comunidades, comunidades totalmente en el abandono total, una pobreza, todavía cuando decimos pobreza extrema es que todavía pueden comer, prácticamente no hay nada, ¿verdad? pero las instituciones del Estado, ¿dónde están? Y al ver que no había mayor este, posibilidad de vivir, sino más bien eh, la, las, eh, los escuadrones de la muerte, la... La, la G2, incluso el, el mismo ejército, empezó a, a elaborar los nombres de, de quienes pues, son los posibles miembros de la guerrilla. Y resulta que yo aparecía en el listado. Dije, aquí la cosa no, no va por ese lado. Sí, pero si, le, si el Estado me está pagando para acercarme a la población, si el Estado me está pagando para ir a por lo menos prestar, un, al menos indicarle a la gente cómo tiene que cuidar su salud, y resulta que ahora me están acusando que yo soy parte de, de un grupo de personas que están en la montaña. Entonces, como que me obligó a entender que quizás el grupo en donde uno podía tener uno más, más comprensión de la vida fue la guerrilla. Entonces, porque incorporé la guerrilla más o menos en la 1982 ya a, la, a las montañas. La respuesta estatal ante, ante ese desafío va a ser eh, la implementación de fuerzas de tarea a partir del año de noviembre de 1981, que significó eh, la realización de centenares de masacres en contra de las comunidades indígenas. De acuerdo con los datos de la Comisión para el Esclarecimiento Histórico, más de 440 aldeas fueron arrasadas. Eh, un millón de guatemaltecos, hombres, mujeres, eh, mayoritariamente indígenas, tuvieron que desplazarse, sea a México, es decir, al, al norte del país, o a zonas selváticas, donde establecen las comunidades de población en resistencia.
centro es este, ¿eh? el centro del cuadro, mira el cuadro, aquí, cuando uno teje sabe que... En principio era como confrontar con estos estigmas que había, digamos, incluso desde cuando yo le dije a mi papá que me quería militar, me dijo, bueno, tienes que pensar muy bien, porque en principio, si te vas, lo que menos quiero es que te regreses con hijos, ¿ya? porque si vas a ir a luchar, es que vas a luchar. Se me propusieron a sacar un curso que era obligatorio en el, en el movimiento guerrillero en el que tienes que pasar un curso político y militar, un entrenamiento. Creo que no recuerdo si fueron 15 días o 20 días, intensivo, ¿no? Pero creo que yo daba más la talla para lo político. Entonces ahí te evalúan cuál es tu, tu fuerte, ¿no? Entonces me trasladaron. Pero desde ahí empecé porque me llevaron al campamento donde estaba la dirección. En ningún momento, digamos, dudé de, de, digamos, de la incorporación o de las limitantes que podría tener una mujer, sino que para mí sí había esa posibilidad de desarrollarme como cualquier otro hombre ahí, como cualquier otra persona, porque o sea, no lo sentí ni discriminación, ni por género, ni por etnia, porque también había una integración de mucha gente. Que... Vale. <risa> Saya masalah asal perjuangan udah tahu semenjak saya usia sembilan tahun. Karena orang tua terlibat situ juga kan, terlibat di gam di PK. Terus waktu tahun sembilan lapan bangkit lagi kan. Jadi karena kita mungkin di, uh, melihat kondisi Aceh seperti apa waktu itu kan banyak rumah-rumahan yang diambil di perkuasa, jadi kita nggak terima. Jadi bangkit semangat perjuangan. Akhirnya naik naik ke gunung latihan. Kalau kami di sini kelatihan, latihan militer. Kadang-kadang di kepung ada juga di sini. Orang lari ke arah sana semua ke bukit tu. Cuma yang tinggal yang kelari saya bertiga di sini mantau keadaan. Pertama sekali saya latihan di di Makmur lima belas hari. Terus di sana di kepung oleh aparat jadi kami dibawa ke pesantren di Mambesa di sana setelah itu latihan di Bedada satu bulan lima belas hari setelah habis latihan sama latihan kami dibawa pulang ke pesantren lagi setelah itu baru disuruh pelatih untuk kaum perempuan laki-laki Como que los acuerdos de paz pasaron sin que nos dimos cuenta, la población no se dio cuenta, otra vez estamos viviendo en los, en los tiempos antes de la firma de los acuerdos de paz. Sí.
Quizás las formas de lucha han ido cambiando, pero para mí siguen vigentes las razones que me motivaron cuando tenía 22 años de incorporarme a la lucha, a la lucha guerrillera. Hay un Estado que lo único que hace es agredirnos. Hay un Estado que lo único que hace es, es despojar nuestras tierras para entregarlos a otros que aparecen como dueños. Entonces, ¿qué vamos a hacer? Y nos vamos dando cuenta que este, cuando estamos haciendo ese, ese ejercicio de, de poder, ese ejercicio de autoridad, nos vamos encontrando ¿verdad? que para este Estado no le importa hacer ese ejercicio de mediación, sino más bien resulta que fuimos los primeros en ser criminalizados por hacer esa labor de mediación. Creo que esto no es tema de los pueblos indígenas, esto es tema de líderes indígenas, es muy distinto. Yo viajo mucho al interior de la república, usted quiere poder indígena y él me dice que no. ¿Qué quiere él? Él quiere mejores caminos, quiere mejores drenajes, quiere mejorar la escuela, quiere que haya un juzgado de paz penal y no solamente, y que quiere que haya una oficina del Ministerio Público, una Fiscalía General. Él quiere luz, agua, más servicios de telefonía. Eso es lo que quiere. Jurisdicción indígena no lo quiere los, entre comillas, pueblos indígenas. Eso es un arma política que manejan líderes. Yo les veo como eh, líderes con pocas personas que intervienen en forma violenta, que violan la Constitución, violan el Código Penal, violan el principio de la propiedad privada y aducen argumentos como derechos ancestrales, que no están ni siquiera bien determinados porque dicen que son orales y no escritos, es decir, son argucias. Evidentemente, el racismo ha sido una de las causas de la persistencia de la desigualdad en, en Guatemala. A lo largo del siglo XX y en el siglo XXI, todos los indicadores sociodemográficos nos muestran que son las familias indígenas las que son más pobres, las que tienen menos acceso a educación, las que tienen menos, salud, menos acceso a servicios de salud y quienes están eh, proporcionalmente en mayores condiciones de pobreza. Para entender la realidad guatemalteca de, prácticamente desde el siglo XVI hasta la fecha, tenemos que tomar en cuenta que en nuestro país se constituyeron las clases dominantes y oligárquicas no solo más conservadoras, sino más represivas del, del continente. We should be particularly worried about the role of gender and the work that gender does in international politics in the contemporary political environment. Uh, the rise of new authoritarianisms, leaders who thrive on a denigration of others, on a denigration also of women and a deep disrespect for women. These are also leaders who very often celebrate certain forms of militarism, celebrate hierarchy, putting down of those who are weak.
denke eigentlich, dass wir es verdient haben, Kyklis, wenn wir diese Aufnahmen überlegen. The link between uh, inequality and conflict is very controversial in the literature, with a number of people denying that there is such a link at all. And in order to find out if there really is one, because we believe there is one, we have been trying to collect a lot of data. And uh, we're trying to do that at the level of ethnic groups as opposed to individuals, which has been the previous way of measuring inequality. And lo and behold, if you focus on ethnic groups, you can actually show that there is a strong link between inequality and conflict. Like any other normal working day, we had all gone to work and by about 10 in the morning we realized the city was in flames. There were organized gangs that were going down the streets, attacking all the homes and, uh, well, mostly setting them on fire. When I came home, the gang had just arrived and they were setting fire to a neighbor's house. They were carrying kerosene oil cans, they were all equipped with poles and crowbars and they looked like they were just executing someone's orders. They didn't attack my home because, you know, we were perceived as people who spoke their language and, well, because of our southern connections. Afterwards, I had lots of questions. Who was I? What is my true identity? Would it be safe for me to say that I was from the North? Would it be safe if I changed my birth certificate? But for that particular incident, that what happened to her in that 2001, I was like, I lost confidence, I lost trust. I have a different perspective, different thought about Christian and Christianity. But as a result of that, I begin to ask, ah, so this, it means there was a plan to kill and do away with Muslim in play two states. And then at that 2001, those thoughts, those narratives begin to, to, to show themselves. We, we begin to hear that Christians were saying play two state belongs to Christians. And we heard that Christians want to Christianize the whole of Plato State so that Plato State will be their headquarters in Nigeria. So many of those kind of narrative. That was how we started seeing differences, segregation in Plato State. Who went through trauma management? 
joint sessions. I have facilitated my um, from 2001 to date. Who actually is an indigenous? Who actually is a settler? The Nigerian constitution does not specify. But again, it has negated itself by asking people to bring indigenous certificates, especially in quota system that we find in Nigeria. The Federal Character Commission actually gives credence to that. In a society like Nigeria, where it is actually a communal, you find out that the issues surrounding ethnicity is so rife. And so, before you are given a job, you will have to be asked if you have an indigent certificate. That also brings the role of traditional rulers into question. What actually are the roles of the traditional rulers? They are the ones that sign the indigent certificates, and yet they do not have constitutional roles. Now, the whole thing about ethnicity is all about fighting for space, also about resource control. And it also has to do with the increase in population and the spaces are becoming smaller. And some people are feeling threatened that they are the original owners of this place. They are likely going to be dominated by others. The gradual transformation of Jos not being a tin mining city anymore and not being a location where you have more businesses thriving, resources became very scarce and people were having to like struggle over very little resources and much of the livelihoods are around farming and civil service work and these are divided amongst, you know, the local indigents and the settlers. When settlers who have the identity only known around just started scrambling or asking for social justice to be included in the scheme of things, either to be employed as civil servants, to contest elections and you know hold positions of authority. It became an issue to fight to address these inequalities. El haber visto eso me da la, la responsabilidad de tener que contar al, al mundo académico y al mundo al, y a las personas en, en general. ¿Cuál era la verdad en torno a, a lo que estaba sucediendo ahí? Los medios de comunicación en Guatemala muchas veces eh, generan noticias eh, parcializadas en torno a la situación que los pueblos viven. La situación es sumamente compleja frente al Estado y a las empresas extractivas. Esto ha generado que las problemáticas en los territorios vayan incrementando, ya que el, tanto el Estado como las empresas han promovido eh, agresiones directas contra líderes comunitarios. Y las comunidades han podido demostrar su inocencia, han podido demostrar que no han sido ellos quienes han iniciado la agresión. Eh, los pueblos indígenas están defendiendo su territorio, están defendiendo los bienes naturales y, y la organización comunitaria provee, digamos, esa, esa plataforma que ha sostenido la organización comunitaria por siglos. Desconocieron nuestras consultas, aparecieron las licencias, aparecieron otros dueños en nuestras tierras y territorios que los cerros ya tienen dueños, tal empresa. Lo único que vamos a estar entonces exigiendo a este Estado, a estas autoridades, si no tienen la capacidad de gobernar en
how we go to this world and how... 2001 comes around the corner. There was that rumor that kept some weeks to that particular day. When that particular woman was about to pass to that particular mosque where the crisis started, I think those eight people refused her to pass. One, because she was a lady. Secondly, being a Christian. And they said she will not pass. And the girl stood her ground that she must pass. So it was at a result of that struggle between that girl and these eight boys that the problem just erupted, the crisis just erupted. So there were rumors. Some people said they beat her up. Nobody knows the truth. Some people said because they refused her to pass and she went and called some other boys who were Christians and they started fighting between them and that was how it all started from our project adopting this gender lens and looking at the micro level of conflict dynamics and conflict cycle uh, we came across a lot of very interesting and important uh, what we call intersectionally gendered social mechanisms one first mechanism that is important is the role that rumors play in conflict escalation and also in conflict management. Interviewing people that were affected by the onset of violence, we realized that many, uh, many persons reacted uh, toward having heard like certain information, a certain person being attacked or a certain a mosque or a certain church. So different types of groups, yeah. Different types of this groups. This rumor dynamic really contributed to the spiraling of the conflict. We also found that these rumors are important because they are gendered. In our environment, it would appear rumors play uh, so much of a role in what we hear. You, sometimes you want to dismiss it, but sometimes you don't want to dismiss it. Because severally, you've heard stories that sounded like rumor, it turned out to be true. For us in the civil society, you have your ways of getting information. So you find communities that call you and pass information to you. And it is your job to verify that information before you can even get the security involved. So I want to know the correlation. How do you manage it? When certain groups uh, are hearing that women have been attacked, for instance, then this rumor is triggering the notion, for instance, of masculinist uh, protection, um, this socially constructed representation of uh, how men are expected to behave uh, in a certain context, and which can push them, to some extent, coerce them into fulfilling the script, fulfilling this expectation of masculinity, which can then push them into spiraling violence. According to our finding, about 35% of fighters in Ambon at the time during the conflict 1999 to 2002 were boys. Maybe we can also call them as children because they age at the time where, where they involved was around 10 to 15 years old. So they participate in the violence because the, they have the, that kind of perception that a good man, an honor man, uh, is a man who can defend their uh, honor as a person, as family, as community, as well as their religion. Also, they have the local say as parlente, which is you have to show off. As a man, you have to show off. So in order to be a good man, an honor man, you have to also allow to perform with the violent act. Yeah. <laughs> 
No, no. Young people are no longer interested in going to school. They rather want to stop and watch the military men at the security point. And uh, I had a conversation with one of them a couple of years ago, and he told me that, honestly, he will go to school one day. He will go to school when he has achieved his aim. And I said, what is your aim? That he wants to be a soldier. And I said, why do you want to be a soldier? That he wants to be a soldier so that he can defend his community. You know, for him, this is a young man, about 11, who has already lost his parents, who was telling me this is his story. I will go for peace. I will work in this cause because I wouldn't want that previous experience to come back. I don't want any of my siblings to die again. I don't want us to to go through what we have went through. And I felt this is the only thing I can do and contribute. Probably it will make sense to other people not to fight. It will make sense to people not to agree to what we hear from media, from, because, and from some of our religious leaders, most especially, where they will instigate and just show you that these people are enemies of yours and you need to fight and do away with them. My decision to work in this cause, most especially being a woman, I have a program that I want to do with women. And I want to talk to them. Peace and peaceful coexistence from the women perspective, what women can do. So getting the women to listen was an issue because it's either their husband or their parents, those that we are not married, will not allow them to come. The woman is supposed to accept whatever comes her way, whether she wants it or not, whether it is conducive for her or not, but the expectation from, from people is that she is supposed to accept.
kenang-kenangan wadah dewan wadah calek saya sendiri harus pilih orang lain karena waktu itu saya pun enggak berkeinginan ke situ cuma karena dibutuhkan 30% harus ada perempuan hmm. enggak ada perempuan yang naik hmm. maka taruhlah nama saya di situ biar orang laki bisa naik kadang-kadang suara kita lebih banyak dari laki-laki kita enggak tahu di form, form C nya enggak dikasih karena begitu kita lihat uh, uh, di kecamatan udah sekian tinggalnya yang lain udah hilang karena di Aceh kan kalau kita masuk ke pesantren dibilang uh, jangan pilih perempuan karena perempuan tidak boleh jadi pemimpin kalau saya nggak setuju karena dewan itu bukan pemimpin tapi untuk menampung aspirasi masyarakat in Aceh before conflict women they were occupying the domestic sector out from the house because there are a lot of post of the military. So the post of the military are the ones uh, um, having the duty to uh, control the men's identity, whether they are having red and white. Red and white is the flag of Indonesia, red and white identity. So they prefer not to go out from the house. So the women take the job of men. For instance, in the rice field, women usually only have a little bit. But during the conflict and then whole day, women are in the field. And while men, they usually go back to the house at 10 o'clock in the morning to avoid the, the military. But unfortunately, it's already good. They, the women, they can enter the public sector. But now, after the conflict, and then men said that, you know, uh, women, they can enter the public sector only during the emergency. And now, women they are sent back again to the kitchen. Mi participación en la función pública se dio en una coyuntura muy, muy particular. El problema eh, que se da en el ministerio es que hay mucho tráfico de influencia. Y entonces a ese tráfico de influencia, pues entonces obviamente pues, eh, más el racismo. Pero entonces eh, los actos de racismo y discriminación llegaron a un nivel Entonces que yo dije, sí, voy a renunciar, pero no miré callada. Entonces eh, yo hice una conferencia de prensa denunciando eh, que yo renuncié, que renuncié por presiones y fue por acto de discriminación de género y por acto de racismo. El Ministerio Público lo tomó como oficio, pero en este país no pasa nada y es un, es un proceso legal muy, muy engorroso y muy caro. Y entonces yo decidí dejarlo hasta ahí. Pero eh, la experiencia fue muy aleccionadora. Me gustaría regresar en función pública, pero cuando hubiese un gobierno democrático. También entendí que mucho de lo que hacía es que era parte de esa forma de vida de mi pueblo y entonces, eh, y por lo tanto, pues implica entonces también eh, luchar en contra de ese racismo, en contra de la explotación, en contra de ese clasismo, en contra de, de ese machismo. Sí.
She also has another serious experience. She contested senator. In a country like Nigeria, it's so difficult for women to emerge politically. So it has to be backed by law because our culture is so male-controlled and male-dominated. So even when you look at the women that emerged, they did not contest. They were purely selected. So they were not allowed to contest. So if we have a law backing certain percentage, which is the 35% which Nigeria signed for, you understand? If we're able to have that entrenched into our policy, then it becomes a lot easier. Then women will be confident you know, to come out and put in their resources to run election. God bless Plato. Thank you. I'm making a very strong appeal to the United Nations on behalf of Nigerian women. All efforts to get women have the ticket to be represented has always failed. They use force, they use violence. Where we even win elections, they will obtain it. And therefore appealing that a special slot be given to women until women participate effectively or have at least 35%. A number of studies that are out there today very clearly indicate a solid and robust correlation between the likelihood of a society to solve conflicts violently and the degree of gender equality in that society. If we really want to end war, we need to end gender inequality. Entonces, en conjunto con otras eh, compañeras, eh, Rigoberta Menchú, Otilia Lush, Rosalina Tuyuk, María Toj, eh, Julia Zum, pues eh, creamos la Asociación Política de Mujeres Mayas. Apoyamos mucho, fui parte del equipo del digamos, de eh, Rosalina para la promoción de su candidatura. Cuando Rosalina gana, pues para nosotros fue como un, pues, un gran logro porque por primera vez, o sea, desde, desde el movimiento maya, una mujer indígena llega a ser... Lo más difícil es cómo realmente las mujeres indígenas podemos participar desde una representación. Que eso es muy difícil para mí porque tiene que ver con conciencia, tiene que ver con claridad, tiene que ver con que realmente estás eh, comprometida también con la sociedad, con las mujeres, con la población. Necesitamos los votos de la mayoría, la cual no tenemos, sin embargo estamos eh, participando en las diferentes comisiones donde estamos canalizando interés de la población. Los pueblos originarios nos han pedido a nosotros, como miembros de la Comisión Indígena de Guatemala, que no necesitamos ni reglamentar ni otra ley porque tenemos el convenio 173 y está clarito y lo que están pidiendo es el respeto. Guatemala es un país miembro de Naciones Unidas y por lo tanto debe respetar las normas de las Naciones Unidas para escuchar a los pueblos originarios de este país. Estamos afrontando una crisis civilizatoria y esa crisis civilizatoria nos la han impuesto una minoría que controla el mundo y no puede ser que eh, 7 mil millones de habitantes tiene el planeta, no puede ser que un grupo minoritario eh, haya definido una forma de pensar, una forma de actuar, una forma de ver el mundo y la vida. Los pueblos originarios eh, tenemos un planteamiento muy distinto, un, eh, pluriverso, Y eso es lo que Naciones Unidas, las entidades a nivel mundial, las religiones, deben, ahí sí que deconstruir ese paradigma único de pensar y de actuar que nos ha deshumanizado. Y por eso, como dicen los grandes abuelos mayas, la grave problemática es que perdimos la naturalidad de la vida. Thank you.
सिकल का एक सिकल का वे शीख सिकल का दी शीख सिकल का सभी अच्छा और सपना दे आत्मा आपका कारो आत्मा आपका विलकवास कृपा कृष्ण का भी कृपा If you look at what happened right after the war in Sri Lanka, there was different types of memorialization and different types of monuments that were coming up around the country. And it was certainly from the perspective of the victor. And as soon as you have an official narrative from the point of view of the victor, what happens is any other narrative becomes the other. It becomes inauthentic. It becomes questionable. and we have seen that happen over the years in sri lanka as well now if you look within the communities as well often the commemoration the memorialization is a product of the loudest voices that you can hear look at the street names look at the statues it will be an incredibly narrow notion of who we are of who counts of who makes history of who is in our history and therefore who should be in our history post war memories and attitudes are often very complicated and goes far beyond the us versus them binary for instance is a case that in this very remote border village called yakaweva which is a singhala village uh, where we interviewed members for the pluralistic memories project some very interesting understanding of memory came up Yakaweva suffered a terrific bus bombing in 2006 where about 63 people died in an ambush and they also were subjected to serial displacements in the war. What was interesting was that we could not really detect any grudge against Tamils on the part of the villagers. These villagers had lived side by side contiguously with Tamil communities before the war and after the war there is some some of this contact has returned the villagers did not blame tamil civilians for what had happened their anger in fact was directed at the politicians on both sides you know um we still have connections with them they live in the village next to ours and we meet in close ties we farm together cultivate together and even share food of the same plate the only difference is in their religious practices apart from that we are still very close in the pluralistic memories project what we have tried to do is to give voice to the less heard narratives within the community to create diversity so that there can be cross talk based on that diversity between the different communities exactly the same pattern of this all those who have access to a broader range of more diversified memories of of conflict related experiences are the same who are more likely to support more inclusive policies to reconstruct the country to deal with the past to move towards reconciliation we have tried to document and archive uh, multiple narratives of loss and healing i think during a war and during conflict uh, people respond in multiple ways uh, you know people react to loss whether it's a loss of a loved one whether it's loss of property whether it's break up of community relationships uh, so these narratives have come from muslims from singalese from tamils uh, from ex combatants from women from men and so what we've tried to do is to capture at least to give people a some sense of the multiple ways in which people have reacted to the conflict but also the multiple ways in which people are healing and overcoming their trauma um i know this because i visit them all the time and we talk about things that happened to us they have suffered just like us 
the injustice we experience, they have experienced it as well. Similar to us, they have lost their children and husbands to war. If you tap into diverse memory, what you will find is that there is shared memory across the different communities. And that is why it's important to tap into these private memories that are not depicted necessarily in the official narrative, where you can build crosstalk between the communities based on those similarities that you see in the private memories. So it was during that workshop that I come to understand both the Muslim and the Christian were in the same shoe that both of us have suffered greatly that we all have casualties that we all lost love uh, lost our dear ones because we we are given time to 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 share our experiences to share what we are feeling that workshop was really a turning point for me In nearly any conflict you look at, you will find examples of people who resist the categories of us and them. Even in the worst of times, you can see the best of humanity. And I think it's absolutely critical to have that more nuanced view, to get away from the notion that hatred is inevitable and hatred is natural because that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. We have to preserve those alternative histories, that more nuanced view of things in every single way, whether it be in archives, whether it be in the films we make, whether it be in the newspaper accounts that we give of events. I mean, I think that there is no one version of the truth, no one version of the conflict. Each individual has their own experiences and each of those experiences is well worth knowing. It's valuable. It is part and parcel of the challenge of reconciliation in this country that we address the diversity with regard to the pain and suffering that people have experienced. Well, actually, they call it Peace Memorial Room. But within the room, actually, they provide some picture, movies, show them the evidence. There was a conflict in Aceh, uh, which is this conflict uh, didn't tell to the students, to the young people through the school. They don't never talk about that kind of horrible history in Aceh before. So that's why then the local government set up this peace memorial room. They want to show it because they want also to, to tell to the young people that conflict actually created a lot of suffering to the people and it was so difficult to overcome from this suffering. Well, we live in an era now where alternative facts and fake news uh, distort policy making and in fact the problems that we talk about here in this research about the link between inequality and conflict could actually get worse because of this. So in order to overcome these problems you need to shed light on these problems and therefore you need evidence-based research. Linking research into development operations, that's a big question. If you want to implement a good infrastructure or water or agricultural project, you use different knowledge, you use different research than, for instance, uh, if you focus on peace or society issues. The difference between the Agenda 2030 and previous poverty reduction frameworks is its goal 16. It's the goal on peaceful, just and inclusive societies and that gives the poverty reduction agenda a policy impact, an impact on the reduction of root causes for 
poverty or humanitarian crisis. There are lots and lots of interventions on ground whereby it targets young ones, it targets women, it targets all stakeholders. So if we can bring these interventions together, there will be hope for the future. Estamos constituidos en una sola de carne y hueso, dirían los cristianos. Sin embargo, somos diferentes. En historia, ya, para empezar, somos diferentes en contextos. Somos diferentes en visiones, en pensamientos. Si cada vez trabajamos por entender esas diferencias, pero también comprender al otro, si nuestra visión se enmarcara más en esa aceptación integral, creo que el mundo sería distinto.